Yes. The session is going to be chaired by Dr. Suresh Subramanian. He is Vice President, Industry Solutions, HP. The panelists of this session are Dr. Manpreet Singh Manna, Director in Charge, Swayam Cell at AICTE. Mr. Pratik Mehta, Director, Education at Microsoft India. Mr. Shantanu Prakash, Founder and Managing Director of Educom Solutions. Mr. Sandeep Aurora, Director, Marketing and Market Development, Intel, South Asia. Dr. Charvi Mehta, Senior Consultant, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. And Dr. Rachna Pant, Principal Ramjas School, Archipram, Delhi. I request the panelists of this session to please, please take their seats on the dais. Please give them a huge round of applause. I am going to directly hand over the reins of this session to Dr. Subramanian. Thank you. Dr. Subramanian. The bios of all the panelists are in the speaker booklet, so please refer to those if you need any clarification. Should we just do that? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Suresh Subramanian. I am uh, I'm based in San Diego, California. I work at Hewlett Packard, and I'm, I'm largely responsible for all of uh, HP's education solutions and projects worldwide. Uh, and what I'm going to do over the next about five or six minutes is, is just walk through some of the big learnings we've had and get an opportunity to have you um, experience this, this very distinguished panel that we've assembled for you here. Uh, you know, Pratik started, uh, Pratik started this, and I think I'm going to continue. Pratik said he's a, he's a member of, uh, he's a product of, uh, of India's education system. Let me say this. I, I am a proud member of India's uh, high school education system, and moreover, I'm a proud member of India's government school um, education system. I remember until my ninth standard, my father was paying one rupee for fees, and then it moved up to 11 rupees, and there was quite a protest at that time, you know. Um, the, the, what, 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 I'd, what I'd like to actually share is a very optimistic story, and, and, and we work, um, I've had, the, I've had the pleasure and privilege of working globally with, I would say, close to about 75 different education deployments worldwide across about 60 countries. The joy of doing that is, the, is, 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 uh, is, is that no, is that this is not an easy job. It, transforming education, the digital transformation of education is not an easy job. But it can be done. I mean, if you look back over the last, I, you know, historically, you can look back and say, listen, PCs came, and then we had, you know, we had what happened in 2000, and we had the first Millennium Development Gold, and then you had uh, one laptop per child, and all that. Forget all that. All that happens. The fact is, collectively, between all of you, between us, between the folks on the panel, between the technology companies, between governments, we know what to do. Rajiv mentioned it. It's, I don't think anyone in the first session said we don't know what to do. It's a matter of actually pulling together all of the resources, all of the people, and all of the energy, and actually saying we are going to do it. It's not easy. But I don't think we're at a point where we say, we don't know how to do this the right way. This is a beautiful picture from Ram School. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, the, 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 the visionary principal is here, and, and, and she will get a chance to share with you um, the, the great work that they've done in seventh and eighth grade uh, in, in science. Um, I, I just want to share a couple of things quickly. First of all, the fundamental equation education still holds. With or without technology, the fundamental equation still holds. Complete and total access plus true learning is required if you want outcomes. Remember Rajiv spoke about, and I'm going to refer to Rajiv a number of times because he really laid out the, 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 the platform for us to build this conference, this, build this summit here. Rajiv talked about how 
the transformation of India's economy has to start with the transformation of India's education. True outcome is not just scoring more marks in, in, in your higher secondary. True mark, outcome is not getting into the right universe. True outcome is impacting the social metrics, gender equality, uh, lowering truancy rates, it's increased GDP, it's economic metrics, and then of course it's got education metrics. So really, when we look at education, we have multiple outcomes that we are working towards. And as you look globally towards each of the education deployments that, that we collectively do, I mean, you may, you, you, we have Debjani from Intel here. HP and Intel are working across dozens of countries in these projects, and every time we go in and we do these projects, we start to look at what are the core metrics that we're going after. We start with that, and, and, the, and, and you'll be surprised to learn that education metrics, particularly test metrics, are not, particular, are not the goal of, of digital transformation. It's the larger economic transformation, larger social transformation. Um, I want to stay on this one slide for a few minutes. Um, when you look at building universal access and delivering a digital transformation of education. There are a number of pieces. People talk about PCs or tablets. That's a, that's a critical piece of it. And, and by the way, as you start to, as you start to deliver technology in the, into the hands of the children, it starts to change outcome. But there are many more pieces, and I want to talk through to some of those so that, so that, we, so that we're all, um, so we're all aware of both the complexity of doing this, but also the fact that it's possible to do this. I want to, I want to draw your attention to the, to, to, to the right, where we have professional development. Professional development, teacher training, empowering the teachers, getting them completely prepared for what follows is critical. It's a piece that has to be thought through right at the beginning, before you start the project. It's a digital transformation of technology is different from putting out an RFP for, for, for PCs. It, buying PCs for the students is one of the pieces. The teacher training is another piece. Look at the one right above that, print plus digital. You know, about 15 years ago, there were, there were all kinds of reports that said the paper is dead. The paper, uh, paperless office was gonna come and the paperless school was gonna come. Today, when you ask people, I think people have calmed down a little bit about that. The reality that we have learned across from all of these global deployments is that paper is not dead. The paper textbook is not going away completely. But the joy of using paper, the retention from paper, the, leading, the reading experiences from paper, the ability to, to, to consume content from paper in a different way from digital has to be coupled with the absolutely unconstrained and limitless amount of information that you have digitally. So what you're going to see going forward is paper and digital building together. HP has a technology called Live Paper where we actually build textbooks that link directly to the web. And, and, and after this conference, after this session, we can speak. If you're interested in that, I can speak with you about that. It's a way in which government investment in, in, in textbooks, and by the way, government investment in textbooks goes into billions of dollars. How do you preserve that investment, not lose it, but actually are able to take advantage of it in the digital space? And that's a very critical piece that we have to do. How about the one on the left, the infrastructure piece? Infrastructure is critical. The architecture within which the technology is deployed is critical. Solar power is a piece of it. Internet access is a piece of it. Delivery of internet within the school, within the classroom is a, is a piece of it. We saw some of the technology um, being presented earlier from 4SL. Can we build an architecture for a school that does not have internet access? Can we build an architecture for a school that has, doesn't have persistent broadband but has some form of a broadband, maybe at night? Um, can we build a, a program where uh, where we have uh, 4SL kind of boxes that are on a 4G network and we work with Bharati and, 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 uh, and Vodafone that all night long, that the night bandwidth can be used for schools but the day bandwidth is used for commercial. We've got to think through the architecture pieces of it. And if we don't think of the architecture pieces, then digital transformation will be limited to the large cities and that would be a real shame because the, because the tremendous potential is, is also outside of the, outside of the large cities. 
Um, if you look at deployment and support, if you look at uh, the learning environments, each of these pieces needs to be thought through. The, my, my objective of putting this slide here is to say that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Collectively, as a team, if we are looking at digital transformation, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The companies that are here, the, the, the industry partners that are here, everybody from Intel to, to, to Joanna Technologies to Microsoft, Everyone has done their share of building and learning on this. Our job is to actually take those learnings and start to make it happen. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of the learning is already there. Um, by the way, universal access comes in many forms. Here, here is an example. This is just one example. This is a classroom for adult learning that's been put together in a, in a, in a shipping container. I mean, put a whole classroom in, you got computers, you got local architecture in there, and it's delivered, it's done. Universal architecture comes in many forms. You have remote, you have remote education, you have um, even, even what Rajiv presented. They were, uh, one example of that was children taking their PCs home. Another example was children sitting in the classroom in a lab model. A third was an example of children having PCs on a one-to-one -one basis, so one child had access to one device. You have multiple models and universal access comes in many forms. What we have to do collectively before we launch into this, okay, let's transform this school or this district or this state, is to really think through what is our ultimate goal in terms of the outcomes we're looking for? What's the current setup? What's the current status of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of teacher training, of school infrastructure, of, of internet, of, uh, um, uh, of, 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 of delivery of power? and then start to build out the right architecture. Otherwise, we're not being fair to the kids. We've got to plan this the right way and do it. We know how to do it. We've done many of these, and I think, uh, I think, I think the time has come. I, I really feel, I feel very bullish, I feel very optimistic that in India, we're actually gonna start pulling all these together. The word I keep hearing in India over and over again in, between all of us is leapfrog. We learn and then we leapfrog. We learn and leapfrog, and that's what we're gonna do here. And I, I guarantee you, if this group, if collectively we all come back, Five years from now, we're going to see a tremendous leapfrog in education that we've done. Um, I, want to, I want to end with five key lessons for you um, from, a, from a vast majority of deployments that we have done globally. Um, the first one is that teacher training is the single best predictor of success of digitizing education. We've done this, I can't even count the number of times we've done this. We've run, we, we collect huge amounts of data before these projects, during the projects, on a, and on a continuous basis. We have what are called data command centers for education that we've built in two different countries that are just churning up this data. The single best predictor of success, by far, it's the variable that loads the heaviest on that equation, is teacher training. If you can get the teachers trained ahead of time, I'll give you an example. In a country called Ecuador, they stopped their entire digital transformation of education project for one year, took all the PCs away from the children and gave the PCs to the teachers and gave them a full year to get trained. And they said, we're not going to go into digital education until the teachers are fully trained and fully uh, in control of the classroom along with uh, content. Four years later, their success rate is significantly, their ramp is much faster than what we've seen in other countries because the teachers walked into the program with one year of training uh, uh, under their belt. It makes a huge difference. The second part is that we've got to modernize the curriculum so we're not just taking what we do today on paper and then throw it onto the, onto the PCs. Uh, we're, we're now in a position to do very different kinds of learning. And what the PC or the digital device allows us to do, yes, you can always PDF what we've got and convert it, or you can always HTML5 it break. But when you start to change the curriculum and the learning modalities and the flow, you start to see very different output. You know, the morning session was fantastic. One of the threads, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that was stated throughout that was that we're not teaching our children to think critically. We're not teaching our things, children to be innovative or creative. We're still pushing on rote learning, and, and we have some panelists here who are experts at this, and we'll speak to it. Um, the way to do that is to modernize the curriculum. So the curriculum folks have to be in front of this together with all of us. The third part is, please, whenever any school is thinking of getting into the digital world, 
and, and Dr. Pant will tell you this, you have to engage everybody right up front. You have to engage the teachers. You've got to engage the parents. You've got to engage the local community. And if in case of higher education, you've got to engage the, the, the employers who are going to take these children when they come out. You've got to engage them up front and keep them as part of the journey. You can't do this journey alone. It's not, it's not about delivering PCs to a classroom and saying, here, let's change the whole world. You can't. Uh, the fourth one is, please collaborate between schools. Everyone's going in this journey. Don't do it alone. The big learning for us is when schools that are going through this process talk to each other, collaborate, figure out, hey, listen, I tried to do it this way. It worked. I did this, and it worked very well. You start to figure out solutions. You have to do it. There is no one alone who can do this. And I, and I, and I'm, and I'm, and, and I can tell you that, um, that, the, that the learning process and the, and the cross-pollination is so incredible when you do this that it starts to deliver greater outcomes. The last piece is, this is something that was mentioned briefly by Bhaskar up front in the first session. I want to touch on this more later on. My, the, the, the big learning for us is please build very strong data and analytics capabilities before you start doing digital transformation or as you are doing digital transformation. Please make the whole country the customer of your data and analytics because it'll come back and help you drive the project better. These projects cannot be done without big data. Today we have great capabilities that, I mean, I mean if, you, if, you, if you speak to Microsoft, they'll tell you about all of the tools that they have uh, for loading up this data in the cloud and, and delivering um, real-time analytics where it's needed, and I think that's part of what we have to do. What I'm going to do is end here. I'm going to get back to my chair there, and I'm going to start the, the, the panel. And here's what I'd like you to I'd like you to pay real attention, because each of the panelists is an expert in one or two areas, and I'm going to try my best to poke on that and try and get as much as I can out of that. All right, thank you. All right, good. Thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna start with um, for those of you who've seen the movie uh, Man of La Mancha and the whole story about the impossible dream. I'm gonna start with Shantanu, who's probably seen more education deployments than I will see in my lifetime. Okay, um, and Shantanu, I'm gonna ask you a, a start with an open open ended question: Are we chasing the impossible dream here, trying to transform education? Because I also hear people tell me that, you know, I say, you know, you know, no, you know, so I just want to, are we chasing the impossible dream uh, or am I just, just caffeinated and just not, you know, optimism is misplaced? Yeah, the short answer is I think you're caffeinated. Uh, <laughs> we are not chasing an impossible dream at all. And I think the data is out there for all of us to see of how many uh, millions of kids in schools in India are now learning either with technology or, or through technology. But I understand, Suresh, where the question is coming from. Why do you even mention this thing about the impossible dream? I think one part of that is the challenge of scale, right? So we have 1.5 million schools in India, and people shudder to think, if we are going to put smart classes in all these schools, how many do we need? Do we have the funds to be able to even achieve this? So I completely understand where the question is coming from. But I think there is, there is hope on the horizon. So when Rajiv got up on stage and said, there is 1% PC penetration in India, as, as the chief executive of Educomp, I think, wow, that's an amazing opportunity. And it's especially amazing for 2016, because now the the depth and the width of the solution that we can bring to the table, which are extremely low cost in terms of uh, the cost per student, it's never been this exciting for technology in education as it's in 2016. So I think this, that's, that's very positive. So now let's be very specific and look at what can be done to achieve this so-called impossible dream. Now, if you want to put a laptop in the hands of every child, somebody is going to come forward and somebody has to pay for it. And I think it's a matter of perspective. The Indian government is already spending, and I learned this from Rajiv's speech, four lakh crores a year in education. Now, if we change the perspective a little bit, 
we don't say this is our IT budget is going to be very high. Let's look at the IT budget as an integral part of the education budget itself. But to do that, you have to first measure ROI. We have a certain model of education in India today. We have classrooms. They need capital expenditure to build. They have furniture. We have teachers. Now with the seventh pay commission, we are going to be handing out a handsome paycheck to every teacher in India. And then we have the whole computational model of education where we bring out education outcomes through smart classes or laptops and tablets and technology immersive education. How do these two stack up? I think we don't have the time to go into the data, but I think the data that's coming out of the computational model of educational outcomes is not a different of one is to two or one is to five, it's a difference of one is to a hundred. So, the, so what I'm putting on the table is investment in computational technology driven models for education outcomes gives you a 1 is to 100x better ROI. Now, just take my word for it for a second. Now, how do we look at our education budget? What part should flow into technology or technology aided learning? I think the answer is very clear. And because the question is not simply stopping at the fact that we need to bring technology in education, the question is much bigger because our educational dreams look impossible right now. Not just the dreams of technology in education. And today's news report in Times of India says there are 8.6 crore kids that are not even inside a school. Okay, so the question, if I may be allowed to modify, is not that the technology dream is impossible, is our education dream impossible? And if our education dream looks impossible, the better way to achieve that is to bring technology to the table, start putting in uh, some money behind educating those 8.6 million because we are never going to be able to build classrooms fast enough. Look, uh, thank you, thank you. I, Ed, I'm not gonna let you off the hook here because I'm gonna come back to a, a, with you a question momentarily in a bit here, but I will take 100 to one ROI. I think uh, I don't have to be a really good businessman to know that, but um, uh, uh, Sadeep, I, I want to I want to continue the uh, the same thread of of uh, that uh, that Shantanu uh, started. And that is, what are we what are we measuring here? What what are we setting out to do? I mean, speaking on behalf of Intel, and Intel has been. I'll tell, I'll speak. I'll say this completely candidly. Intel has been a mentor to us in learning how to do education transformation, and and you have you know, two million plus teachers trained, you've done a ton of work. What are we setting out to do here in reality? And what are we, what are we measuring here? So I think the most important thing here, uh, Suresh, is that we figure out what are we teaching kids right now, and then what are we measuring them on? And that whole debate about rote learning versus are we teaching them uh, uh, skills to problem solve, skills to innovate or not? And I think eventually if we start measuring them on those things, the whole process will change eventually. So look at the very fact about, we worry about science and math education, really. And the program we run, IRIS, ISEF, the science and engineering fair we do, look at the kids who go from India and uh, win awards at this global platform, which is considered to be a junior Nobel Prize. Uh, many of those kids now have uh, minor planets named after them. So the amount of motivation they get by doing those things is tremendous. But are we doing enough? I don't think so. Uh, are we building a culture of innovation? Uh, if, you, if you look at the number of uh, new developments happening, number of patents being drawn in the Silicon Valley versus here, why is there so much difference? If all the bright kids are from India, why do they get to innovate so much as soon as they reach the valley and they can't do it here? because we are not building that culture of innovation at the school level. Where are the labs where they can, where they can you know, tinker with you know, products and hardware? Can they build some things? We need to get to those things where we want technology in the hands of kids, secondary, primary, everywhere, so that technology becomes an integral part of them. There is one angle which Shantanu said on how to use technology to reach to a wider audience. Eight crore kids out of school is a shame. So, while we build classrooms, if it takes five years, why don't we use technology to teach them 
from a remote you know the sensing standpoint that is important but also important is kids who are in school they are being taught the right things they are being given a chance to innovate the chance to produce things versus just reading and learning and giving an exam so that is important and if you look at uh, you know the third point which i want to bring about is uh, motivation motivating these kids are we promoting enough role models which are being talked about at the school level of children who could have been a dropout who had at one point of time thought of dropping out but are doing wonderfully well now and how they use technology access to technology to transform their lives and those stories will enable motivate the kids in small towns and villages to not give up a lot of times they give up after primary school because there is no hope our primary school uh, enrollment is 100% secondary school is pathetic so we need to change that we need to change that by using technology by using technology to teach them and by using technology to tell them stories of hope i want to i want to just stay with this innovation idea and the and the innovation topic and i want to get to um dr pant who is the uh, principal at ramja school ramja school for those of you who know particularly her branch of the ramja school has been an award winning school and she personally um set out to transform two classes two standards two two sets two cohort groups with technology and and what i want to ask you is what what was the big learning for you not not in terms of what the obstacles were the obstacles are there we'll get over but what was the big reward for you when you saw these children go through the first year of using technology particularly as it came to creativity innovation etc thank you so much the first thing that i would like to say is i must put my thanks to hewlett packard as well as learning links foundation anjali prakash is already there because they were the people who hand held me and made me move forward and told me never say die just keep on going so that is the now coming to what is it that we had we faced the thing that actually made me feel very good was the fact that in a class we had the poor learners the slow learners the average learners and the bright ones and generally we were always catering to the average learners here with uh, with tools like naiku which hp had given us what happened that the children the teachers were making assessments as per the level of the child and the second most important thing was the weak children they never wanted to ask questions they were shy so what they started doing was they were doing their assessment on their own they were improving because they were getting ecolards those little brownie points a little smiley faces and things like that and they started improving the self worth was there which is something which is very much needed then there were a group of students i still remember there were one or two students of grade 7 they were very bright students now they used to get bored and they would play truancy they would not like to be there in the class they would be dis disruptive classrooms were what was happening so the teacher of class 7th gave those children matter of class 9th and you will not believe how excited they were and the things that these children were doing i will give you two major examples over here one is a student by the name of hemkesh hemkesh agarwal he was so sort of innovation as you talk about you're talking about the un mandate and you're talking about the handset the headset uh, and the heart sets here this child was so creative that he went out and he gave a lecture to all the scientists of agricultural institute at hyderabad and his name figured in india today for sort of actually doing something which a small child of class 8th could not could had done for all the others the other is another student of mine called shorab what he did he made his own theory of the universe now these were amongst the bright ones who were motivated to do something more he wrote his own theory of the universe and that he sent to nasa and there was an acknowledgement from there for the work that this child had done now just see what this 
technology has done, because if technology is the answer, what is the question? The question is, how can we motivate these students? How can we improve the students who are uh, slow learners or they are weak? How can we motivate the teachers? Because the teachers, they used to flip class classroom beautifully. They used things like uh, uh, movie makers. They were using yammers and they were using trackers to see that the children were not going astray. So all these were ecolats, all these were beautiful learning experience and now, as it was already said in the previous session, the improvement in uh, sort of academics is 17%. The second thing is attendance. Students would like to, now this is the class where everybody wants to go. They do not like to be in the other classroom here. The, so attendance is 100%. Third very important thing is nobody wants to take an exam. Here, exam, this assessment became like a game. Because what was happening, the results were seen immediately. So it was like a game. When you play a game, what happens? You get the scores immediately and you want to better your score. So the same thing was happening now. So they were getting their scores, they were doing it again, and they were improving. What more can a school ask? What more can a teacher ask? What more can the head of an institution ask? And I always feel, I remember the time, the, the lines of uh, A Tale of Two Cities, it is the best of times, it is the worst of time, it is the age of wisdom, and it is the age of folly. So if we use it, it is the best of time. If we don't, it is definitely the worst of time for those who don't use. It is the age of wisdom, yes, for all of us over here. And it will be foolishness if you do not take it to the classroom. Thank you so much. You know, I, I would never have believed that we would get a Dick, Dickens quote today. And I, didn't, I forgot you were there. I forgot you were there on the panel. Uh, you know, we, we were, we're talking through K through 12. We're talking through schools. But education and really, and, and Bhaskar Pramanik mentioned this multiple times this morning, you can, and Dev Jani did as well, you can't, you can't transform an economy if, if, if functionally half of the f people are illiterate or don't have access to education. And so moving on to the topic from, of, of adult education and lifelong learning, I want to actually um, uh, move to my right here and, and ask Dr. Banna. Uh, Dr. Manna is actually director in charge for Swayam. Swayam was mentioned this morning very prominently. Dr. Manna, my question for you is, you're the director in charge. There are lots of MOOCs out there, okay? At, 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 you know, but I, I, people talk about MOOC being a fashion, that it came in and it went, etc. What's your vision? Why is Swayam going to succeed? What's the plan here? Thank you. Thank you very much. How come this word Swayam has come up? I have to just take the just brief history behind it. Government of India giving number of scholarships, subsidies to whole country. Scholarship for the post matric, scholarship for the gate, scholarship for the GPAT, etc., etc., etc. Some they got, some may they not got. Reason is very simple. Some states, if there is a corruption, the scholarship may not to reach. Okay, we started with the DBT, direct beneficiary transfer. But finally, where it goes? It goes with the student who has a good parents, could give the good education and he could get some rank or some percentile to achieve this goal to be get the scholarship. What happened to others? A ward of rickshaw puller, a ward of laborer. He could not get. I'll tell you the story. Today in India, if there are 10,000 of engineering institutions, 40% seats are empty, but in the same city, same area, all the coaching centers and academics are over flooded. You go to any academy because everybody wants their ward should go to either IIT or IM or ISC, sometimes NIT. Very sorry state. Next. Government started with the distance education. Okay, we do not have the number of schools available. We have, do not have the number of colleges available. We will go with the distance education. And what happened with the distance education, everybody knows well. And finally, DEC got collapsed. And we are coming with certain other solutions, small solutions. And government picked up the matter. No more policies, let go for the implementation. No more policies, please. Let go for the implementation. It's a very sensitive topic because I have growing with the SWAM. My career is growing with the SWAM, so I have seen the SWAM from the seed point, so I'm just going to take. 
today's student sitting in a class he can never leave his mobile at home and never wants to be and sitting in the class with the mobile left at home he is feeling very excited oh something is missed he may left his uh, geometry box at home no problem he can borrow the pencil but he never borrow the mobile and he is doing some whatsapp you know sitting in the class also and we never stop in the btech students and mbbs students for the school we have the restrictions still it means that today is a student is screen savvy the second thing is you go to any house even your wards you bring anything new at your home they would like to have the touch feel main papa khud se khol ke karunga mujhe dikhaiye main karta hu yani ke khud se karne ki chaah swayam to humne us shabd ko pakad liya screen ke sath jod diya study webs of active learning for young aspiring minds this is the full form of this swyy young aspiring minds isko confuse mat kijiyega माइंड यंग किसका है सेवेंटी ईयर्स वाले का भी है हाउस वाइफ का भी है ड्रॉप आउट्स का भी है फिजिकल डेथ डिसेबल पर्सन का भी है यानी कि दिस प्रोजेक्ट विच वी हैव कम अप बाय गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया दिस इज टोटली अ प्रोजेक्ट विच कैन बी यूटिलाइज थ्रू कंप्यूटर्स लैपटॉप एंड्रॉयड आईओएस और मे बी विंडोज दिस इज गोइंग टू बी देयर वट बेसिकली यू आर गोइंग टू गिव वी आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द एट स्टैंडर्ड टिल पी this is the world's first mooc which is coming for the school world's first mooc and this is going to be the world's largest mooc which is going to be launch very soon and even that app is very much available you can check from your mobiles now itself it will be in the store why this is required the simple thing is you ask the seventh standard student what is your favorite subject they say mathematics you say oh wonderful it means you understood mathematics no sorry seventh standard student doesn't have that kind of vision to say the subject is favorite because it is a favorite because of the teacher who is teaching a mathematics and the social science teacher may not be good enough they said no no my ma'am is very good so this mathematics is good this is the one thing the second thing in engineering or any professional courses unfortunate case during your examinations you fall sick either it's a chikungunya either it's a dengue or something you lost one semester it means you lost one year it means your whole degree is going to be get delay one year we got this solution also it means that you can select the courses by teacher wise if you wants a good teacher he is in iit kharagpur you are somewhere in bareilly you can opt that course because in all 800 universities in country having a regulation now from ugc 20% credits of your regular courses so called bsc bcom btech etc etc can be earned through swam similarly the regulation has come from aict also for all management technical architecture pharmacy courses 20% credits can be earned because sometimes you know some problem is there in the institution or the teacher you cannot say the teacher sir you are not teaching well my rest credits are wonderful because of you i am losing something i am losing my git i am losing my cat so no problem go to the swam enroll there get registered and get your dmc get one swam subject second thing today you are doing btech but you are very much uh, eager to learn music why not you can learn music you can learn music from swam yes this is called choice based credit system concept which has come by government of india and it is flourishing and it is going to be come in this way thank you sir thank you sir thank you uh, let me ask you please before you put the microphone down um what is the current status of swam i mean it, can anyone log on and enroll is there a does the school principal need to sign off when you enroll is there a uh, you know what 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 kind of a, is there a course completion certificate that you get what what's the status of that yeah. thanks to you given this opportunity because i wanted to speak lot for this and uh, no, no, no. <laughs> i got this no, question yeah. any learner please remove the word student any learner any citizen of country even he has a aadhar number or not even he has a driving license or not can go to this site can get enrolled no otp is required no otp is required no any teachers permission is required no any principal permission is required because he may go for value addition i am learning something in a school but i am not getting a satisfied with my teachers level of teaching i come at home i open my laptop or a desktop or maybe my simple 2000 mobile phone android any mobile phone so called you know carbon etc he can learn from that 
each and every lecture has 20 minutes videos and 20 minutes of metadata means we are having the length of courses. And tomorrow if he is, I have done this course, why not to get the certification? Yes, he can get certified. After completing a course, taking a printout or even not need a printout, send a mail to that university, which university is offered that course, in order to go to that university to give examination. In the same city, he may get one center where he is going to appear for examination with some nominal fee, say 1000 rupees or 1500 and that barcode DMC is there, QR codes DMC is there, he can carry anywhere, anywhere in India or abroad to show, yes, I am a skilled plumber also, although basically I am MA music, but I know the plumbing because I got this certified by Government of India through this my NSDC, National Skill Development Council that I have did this plumbing course. Next, this course has a variety. I need to say something here, from 14 September, on 29 September, we make a Hindi Pakhwada. In that, I have also taken a print. We have to take all government officials to take a print so that we will do whatever we will do in Hindi. The platform is like that. I suppose to be. So, I have to talk a little bit about Hindi so that my print is also there. So, the thing is, today, we are starting with 200 courses. And we will take 2,000 courses in March. And we will take 10,000 courses in 3 years. And we will join 3 crore learners. वो लर्नर्स हाउसवाइफ भी हो सकती है, ड्रॉपआउट भी हो सकता है, रिक्शा पुलर भी हो सकता है। हम किसी से उसकी पहचान ही पूछेंगे हमारे पोर्टल पे आपको ये नहीं टिक करना पड़ेगा आपके आप किस जाति से किस धर्म से बिलोंग करते हैं। ये कॉलम ही नहीं रखा हमने वहाँ पे। ना इसकी ज़रूरत है। और totally free of cost है, totally free of cost। अभी तो आगे हम एक स्टेप जाने वाले हैं, मैं इस प्लेटफॉर्म से बोलने जा रहा हूँ कि बहुत जल्द हम गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया को अप्रोच करके कहेंगे कि आप थोड़ा सा इनफॉरमेशन ब्रॉडकास्टिंग को कीजिए कि जब स्वयं पिक पोर्टल पे जाए स्टूडेंट तो उसका डाटा कंज्यूम ना हो बीएसएनएल इतना हमें थोड़ा सा और फेवर कर दे और जो ऑलरेडी माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने हमें कर दिया है हम उनके बहुत रेडी रहेंगे माइक्रोसॉफ्ट केम अप एंड टुक दिस प्रोजेक्ट एज ए नेशनल प्रोजेक्ट इन्होंने कमर्शलाइज बात की नहीं हमसे दे हैव टेकन दिस प्रोजेक्ट इन दैट वे दिस इज द नेशनल प्रोजेक्ट इज डिवोटेड टू द स्टूडेंट्स डिवोटेड टू द नेशन एंड दे हैव टेकन और शायद मैं इस प्लेटफॉर्म से एक बात और एड कर दूँ हिंदुस्तान की गवर्नमेंट में पहला ऐसा कोई प्रोजेक्ट हुआ होगा मैंने अभी गिनीस बुक ऑफ वर्ल्ड में अप्लाई नहीं किया मैं कर नहीं सकता हूँ मैं बोल देता हूँ जिसको हमने तेरह दिन में पीओ भी दिया और उन्होंने पैंतालीस दिन में प्लेटफॉर्म क्रिएट भी कर दिया और आज आपके मोबाइल में प्लेटफॉर्म है इट इज अवेलेबल सिर्फ मोदी जी के रिबन काटने की इंतजार हो रही है द डे इज गोइंग टू कट द रिबन इट इज गोइंग टू बी ऑनलाइन बीटा वर्जन इज ऑलरेडी अवेलेबल विद 180 एटी कोर्सेज वी हैव सेवन एन सीज इन इंडिया यू जी सी एन सी आर टी सी ई सी इग्नो आई ओ एस आई एम बेंगलोर एज वेल एज एन पी टी एल ऑल एन पी टी एल कोर्सेज आर कमिंग ओवर दियर एंड वी आर कमिंग विद द वर्चुअल क्लास रूम गोइंग टू बी इंटीग्रेट विद द ए व्यू एज वेल एज द माइक्रोसॉफ्ट एज द कंप्लीट वर्जन फॉर द वर्चुअल क्लास रूम मजे की बात सुनिए अभी लॉन्च नहीं हुआ Three countries already approaching us and saying, please, please add us. Government of Australia, Government of Canada. Today, we have had a meeting in the morning that we will have to remove geofencing. We will have to do it globally. This is the future of the world. Thank you very much. 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 But staying with this this national skills development piece. Dr. Charvi Mehta is from the Ministry of Skills Development. Um, what I wanted to hear more from you, Dr. Mehta, was on the PM Yuva project that's about to be launched. And I don't think, I would say very few people here know about it. So that would be very useful. And then I'll have a follow up. Uh, so I'll just share about the PM Yuva program. But before I st start telling you the details of the program, I'll give you a little background. Uh, lakhs and crores of uh, students are getting educated every year. Lakhs of students are getting skilled every year under our ministry. But uh, how are the out outcomes judged? They are basically judged from the placement. Are the students placed? They were skilled. They were educated. Were they placed? And of course, there's a limitation of the economy. So the placement becomes a limitation. So that is where PM Yuva came in. And uh, the ministry decided that it is also important to encourage entrepreneurship and not just skilling and education. So uh, although there are a lot of components of entrepreneurship that need to be nurtured, strengthened, developed, uh, one component that we decided to focus on was entrepreneurship, education, and training. 
Now we had two challenges or rather I would say objectives when we were designing this uh, scheme. Uh, one was uh, quality, inclusiveness and access, outreach. Of course it's a government program so access has to be there. And the second challenge that we faced was that uh, we understood based on our experiences that entrepreneurship is not something that could be taught through lectures, through videos. It had to be something that is something practiced. Uh, you learn it, it's a competency, you develop it. So uh, to overcome these challenges, we finally decided to take up ITC as, uh, or technology as our main tool to reach to the right people. Our focus is to provide entrepreneurship under this scheme, PM Yuva, uh, our focus is to provide entrepreneurship education and training in about 2,200 institutes of higher learning, which includes universities, colleges. Uh, we have uh, premier institutes like IITs, IIMs. We have polytechnics. Other than that, we, our focus uh, was on schools, that is 11th and 12th standard. Uh, the next focus was on ITIs, and last was entrepreneurship development centers. And through entrepreneurship development centers, we were trying to focus on uh, uh, people who are not in the education system, like the dropouts, the 8.6 crore dropouts. Uh, then, uh, where we came to the use of technology, we are using technology in three or four ways. Uh, one is through the MOOCs platform. However, our focus is not only providing uh, education through lectures, uh, we wanted to make it into a blended learning model. So what we are doing is that we will uh, get two or three teachers from each of these institutes, train them to teach entrepreneurship, and they can use the MOOCs platform and they act as a facilitator to make this uh, entire learning more experiential. So how do they make it experiential? They'll, ha they'll have videos going on uh, that will teach. They will do activities within the class. They will be entrepreneurship cells. There are also going to be uh, mock enterprises that they are going to run within the institutes. So the entire module becomes very interactive. The second uh, use of technology that we are doing under this project is through an online marketplace. Uh, this online marketplace is an online platform where we are converging all the stakeholders in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, that is, we have mentors, business service providers, we have uh, 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 credit agencies that are required, we have incubators that are required, and usually a person who wants to start an enterprise always has a challenge. Uh, we also, in, even in the ministry, we receive, receive calls from people saying, how do we start an enterprise? Where do we go? What should be the first step? So this platform is going to be like a one-stop shop where they get all the information required to start an enterprise and they get the right network to leverage and start the enterprise. Uh, the third uh, important aspect is the assessment. Uh, so once the student is trained through these MOOCs platform and technology, uh, leverage, technology leverage platform, the assessment is not through... Uh, uh, exams like the regular exams, we can't say that, see, you could not pass a theoretical exam, you failed, you cannot become an entrepreneur. That's like height of foolishness. So the assessment is going to be more through online games where it is going to be applied. Uh, the a student is actually not going to uh, just uh, see the, uh, the, the amount of theoretical concept he's learned, but actually see if he can apply it or not as an assessment. Then another uh, important aspect of technology that we are using is to manage the entire system. That is the management information system that is going to be inbuilt in the MOOCs platform and in the online marketplace. And the best part of this management information system is that it is not limited to the management at the level of the government, but even the institute that has enrolled and even the teacher can manage through the uh, online system or through the mobile app. So we have mobile apps where the, student, where the teacher can just log on using her, his or her user ID. They can see that this, these are the students who want to get enrolled for the program, enroll them for the program on the mobile app, make batches that these are going to be in section A, these are going to be in B and C. That information gets sent to the students through the mobile app and the student can come for the class. 
Again, the teacher can monitor the progress of the student through the inbuilt uh, uh, system. So when the student uh, takes, the, uh, take, takes, let's say, one of the modules that is there on the mon online market, uh, sorry, on the MOOCs platform, the teacher can see that the student has undergone this, uh, uh, the, the student has undergone the a course. He can also see that if the student has completed the test, how has he fared in the test, so that entire tracking for the teacher, for the institute, for the government becomes very easy now. So this is the platform that we are creating. The scheme has already been launched. I know not many people uh, know about it because we haven't done the formal launch. Although we've started advertising about it, institutes have started onboarding uh, on this, onto the scheme. The formal launch will be done very soon and the courses are going to start from 1st January onwards. Dr. Mehta, before you put the mic away, are these entrepreneurship development centers, are they physical buildings? Are they physical locations? Uh, yes, they are physical locations, uh, uh, including obviously colleges, IT as a physical locations, entrepreneurship development centers are going to be training centers or the entrepreneurship institutes which are going to be there. Uh, since the entire module is going to be a blended learning module, so it is important that there has to be a physical infrastructure. Uh, since uh, this question, uh, Suresh asked me this question, I'd also like to add here that this MOOCs platform is not only limited to the students or the faculty or the institutes that onboard onto the program. It is, uh, it is an open platform and anybody who wants to learn about entrepreneurship, who wants to get trained, even in specific need-based trainings like financial literacy, commun develop communication skills, can access this platform and do it himself like Swayam. Lovely. Thank you. And, and finally, let me ask Pratik, who's, who's been in education and, and speaks on education um, extensively, two words that, uh, that go together, but we haven't heard them be used this morning, are cloud and analytics, and how that is going to impact. There is, there is a tremendous amount of work that Microsoft is doing in, in leading much of the industry into the cloud and the analytics that are building into that. So share with us how everything you've heard, the K through 12 piece, the lifelong learning piece, the, the MOOC piece, how all of that gets transformed to the next level. Uh, sure, thanks, okay. So, uh, you know, we're seeing a, a, a huge transformation happening in education. Uh, everybody in the panel talked about uh, digital education, blended learning, uh, one is to one digital classrooms and, and blah, blah, blah. I think the reality is that all uh, this needs a back-end infrastructure, an infrastructure that can enable a deployment to happen in a much faster way and a much better way. And it's like a pay-as-use model. Uh, gone are the days where you have to build up an IT infrastructure in the schools or in the colleges. I think the reality is that everybody's today talking about, I want to have infrastructure at my fingertips and I want to have infrastructure as and when I want it, okay? I think that's the key thing, as and when I want it, right? So that's where the whole cloud infrastructure is playing a very big role. We're seeing a huge transformation happening in this space. Uh, and I'll share some of the, some of, some of the uh, perspective and experiences that we've gained. Uh, let me talk about uh, Swayam, for example. Uh, the one aspect is building up the MOOC platform, but the other aspect is actually rolling it out. Now imagine the type of scale that Swayam requires, building up that infrastructure in the country or building up that infrastructure in an enterprise is going to take ages and ages, right? So rather than building up the infrastructure on their own, what available today is backend data centers and how can that be leveraged to use that infrastructure to provide a better service and a faster service and a better rollout to the end uh, user. So the end user could be a citizen, could be a student, could be uh, a skilled laborer and blah, blah, blah. I think that's where the cloud is, becomes a very important role. And what we've done at Microsoft is that uh, a year back, Satya was in town and uh, we've uh, now launched three data centers in the country, one in Pune, uh, Pune, the other one is in Bombay, and the third one is in Chennai. We build up a huge infrastructure that will enable uh, educationists, can enable researchers, can enable projects like Swayam or the MOOC platform that uh, Chavi talked about on rolling it out quickly uh, for, uh, for the end uh, recipient. 
when it comes to analytics, this is a very interesting concept. And again, uh, we're pretty new in this area. Uh, you know, this is uh, with respect to discussion that we had with the Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Naidu, uh, almost like eight months back, uh, when again Satya was in town. And he put forth a problem statement. He said, Satya, uh, the big challenge that I have is I don't know whether I am doing the right intervention at the right time in the education space. I'm spending thousands and thousands of crores of rupees in building up uh, education system, uh, in setting up uh, brick and mortars, in constructing uh, schools, but am I doing the right thing? Can you help me out in identifying how am I using my uh, investment and am I using the investment in the right uh, manner? And that provoked a thought process in us as to what is it that we can do as a technology company? How can we help government to take those decisions? And the whole concept about machine learning, uh, intelligence network to be built up actually uh, came up from that uh, discussion. And uh, um, as, as was told in the morning session, we, uh, we worked with the AP government. They had some data which was available in a digital format. Uh, we looked at various uh, perspectives out there. So we looked at uh, fields like uh, quality of education with respect to teachers' availability, teachers' capability. We also looked at the regional aspect, uh, whether the student is in Guntur region or in Kakinada or Rail Sima. Then we also looked at whether the student is coming from an underprivileged society or is coming from middle class or is coming from uh, a good to, uh, uh, um, you know, good financial background students. Then we also looked at the fact that what type of curriculum is being provided. And within the curriculum, is it a specific subject? And then within the subject, it is a specific chapter, and, and that's the type of granularity we looked at. So we created 65 fields. We looked at 65 fields, and we took that data, we churned it, we, we then built up a system which has got 30 million algorithms are running at the back end. And the entire data that came up, we, we put it into the system, and and we came up with a predictive analysis out there. And what we did was that we let the uh, administrator, in this case, the policy decision maker, the, the education department, to actually figure out if a student who's in the sixth class, what is it that's going to make him retain when he reaches to 10th class? And why he would drop out in 10th class? And what could be the reasons why he or she would drop out in the 10th class? So we went to that type of granularity. Now, when we showed that to the AP government, they were thrilled because now they know that if suppose a student is going to drop out, let's say three years down the line or four years down the line, what type of intervention needs to be done? Is he or she dropping out because of a teacher problem, because of a quality problem, because of a regional issue, because of social issues, because of caste issues, and that's how the intervention can happen. Now imagine if you are able to look at, at a policy level, being able to look at all these factors, and you can then do the right intervention at the right time. I think that made a hell lot of difference to them. And uh, we, we rolled that out for the 10th class and 9th class. Now we're going as, uh, uh, as below as 3rd class now. So we are going to get all the data from 3rd class to 10th class, and we're going to do proactive analysis about uh, uh, the, the, the school dropouts or the students dropout in the schools. We are now scaling this program. Uh, we're reaching out to multiple other state governments. We've got some great interest coming from various state governments. And I'm telling you, uh, this is going to change the face of education landscape because now we know what the problem statement would be and how and when the intervention needs to happen. I think that's the beauty of uh, using analytics. The power of data and analytics, especially in transforming education, is, is incredible. I think we're going to see a lot of it. I started this journey with Shantanu. I want to come back and end with Shantanu here um, with, with, with a two-part question, Shantanu. And then since you are between this group and lunch, so you be warned. Um, number one is, where do you see this concept of lifelong learning going? Fundamentally, we're all students. We're all going to be learners. Where do you see lifelong learning going? And then... Share with all of us collectively, because you're, you're, you're the, you're the uh, person with most experience here. What is one thing that makes you optimistic today as you leave this, this podium that uh, we're going we're to make this happen collectively? Sure. Thanks, Suresh. Uh, I think if you look at the word lifelong learning, okay, 
there's two parts to it. One is life, okay, and one is long. So certainly uh, life is getting longer, okay. And but what is more interesting is that the need for remaining economically empowered uh, for a longer time is also becoming more important today. And thirdly, if you look at the future of jobs, the future of jobs has been amazingly disrupted. So 60% of jobs today are going to cease to exist. So lifelong learning, learning is not just a metaphor or a phrase. Lifelong learning, if, you, if you're not going to be lifelong learning, okay, you're going to be obsolete. You're not going to have a job. You will die poor, whatever. So I think it's really, really important that we look at lifelong learning as something that needs to be institutionalized in two ways. One is the cognitive aspect of lifelong learning. And that's where projects like Swayam, etc., come in. Because now you have these uh, thousands of courses out there that can help anybody reskill or rather reinvent themselves from an employability perspective. So that's absolutely a very, very exciting direction to go. Or if you don't want to do that, you want to be an entrepreneur, you have the UVA program. And there are many other programs like this. So I think the world is thinking in the right direction with respect to that. But there is also another aspect of lifelong learning, and that is the mental framework of what it means to be a lifelong learner. And that journey has to start inside the primary school classroom rather than when you're 25 years old or when you're 45 years old. And I think that's where technology actually plays a super important role because the future of the classroom itself has got amazingly disrupted today. Because the skills that we need to build are not the old skills of rote learning, and we all know that, so I'm not going to repeat that. Okay, but the skills of tomorrow, we all know what 21st century skills are. But the question is, how, how are we going to put that enabling framework? And that framework has four important words. One is learning has become democratic. So you cannot force a model of learning that applies to every student in the classroom. That's one. Second, it has to be flexible. So learning has to be at the pace of the, the, the cognitive and the mental ability of the student. And the third most important thing is it has to be inclusive. And, it, and the word inclusive was more important for a country like India than probably any other country in the world. So I think the whole concept of lifelong learning, more important than ever before, but we need to think more deeply about lifelong learning because it needs to start from a mental construct, what it means to be a learner right from the primary school classroom. Your second part of your question, Suresh, is what is the most exciting thing? And I think the most exciting thing is that finally in education, we are cutting the cord from the fact that we need to go into a physical space to learn. So for me, what is supremely exciting is that it's all going to be about cloud, about internet, about low-cost access devices. It's going to be about big data. It's going to be about analytics. And most importantly, what does all of this mean together? You put all the jargon together, end of the day, it's going to be very, very personalized. For the past 1,000 years, we have adopted in the whole world a mass market model of education. That is being deconstructed, that is being demolished, that's being broken. And the model of today, the model of tomorrow, is every learner must learn to, his or her, to maximize his or her potential. And that, for me, is extremely exciting. It's historic. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. One round of applause for the panel, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Shalini, I'm bringing the flight back for an on-time arrival. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you an announcement. Thank you, Prateek. Thank you, Charvi. Shantanu, Dr. Manna, Sandeep, Dr. Pan, thank you. That would be a fantastic idea. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. What are, the specific, what are the specific conditions and what are the basic uh, necessities of those conditions which are required to implement all these things? So many good programs which are already coming in uh, in terms of SWAM, in terms of mock programs. So what are the basic conditions which are required? If someone can answer that. Can I, can I do one thing? Sandeep, do you want to take answering that question? Yeah. See, I think fundamentally there are many programs happening across the board and you know we are driving some microsoft driving some hp driving some government is leading obviously i think at some point 
you know, all of it is not coming together as it should. I think that's one thing which has to happen for sure. So that's a fundamental connect which has to happen. We need to connect the dots and see across the board, starting from primary school to secondary school to higher education, what are the programs being run by industry, government, cut it up across and find where are the overlaps and build efficiencies. I think that's fundamental, it has to happen. And most importantly for any of these things to happen, the first, step, first thing is the will to make it happen. And as Shantanu said first and Suresh mentioned and, uh, and Dr. Manna said, the point is this government is progressive and wants to make things, ha things happen. So that vision and that uh, need to make things happen is there for sure. The vision is already set and that charges people like nothing else. So I think if, if you know, I can request, you know, Dr. Mana, this whole uh, dot connection, and you know, we can, we'll be happy to help the way we can help, and you know, I'm sure Microsoft HP and Shantanu will be able to help. I think once we draw that metric of which programs are running across industry, across government, because when you want to have transformation in the country, what you need is public-private partnership. It will not happen by government alone, it will not happen by industry alone. We are all citizens of India, we have that role to play that we make the country progress, we do everything we can. So that um, metrics if we develop and then we can figure out what w is working well, what to you know, fast forward, what is not working well, what to stop. I think that will accelerate the, fav the, the whole thing much, much more. Got it. Uh, a question right there and then after that, you sir. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi. So I am uh, Dr. Prasad from Amity University. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful session. I actually wa didn't want to attend, but uh, really it made uh, my day here. Uh, what I want to ask is, uh, we have been talking about the technology involvement. Uh, we have been, uh, the initiatives by the government. Uh, it seems reasonable uh, to pose this question, that uh, with power comes responsibility, and we are trying to empower the individuals here with this education and technology transformation. So, the individual gets excited from a psychological point of view, and this excitement results in both sides of the coin. That means there are dangers, there are... So, my question will be about the risks involved by putting these technologies into those hands, which is a big concern, or which will become a big concern in future. That is one thing. So, knowledge is a double-edged sword. So how are we going to control this aspect or uh, moderate this aspect in a way? We need not control, but uh, we should be moderating, at least be conscious of this. Knowledge, knowledge uh, technology is a double-edged sword. So how do we take care of not using the sword for the wrong things? So, uh you know, every action is, has a reaction. Let's accept that reality. Uh, uh, technology intervention, is it required? The answer is absolutely required. And there are multiple reasons that the panelists spoke about. Uh, accessibility, equitable education, quality of education. Uh, so the, the need is there. And the answer to the need cannot be brick and mortar. Okay, you will never be able to scale using brick and mortar solution. So you need technology that can provide uh, accessible education and quality education to the wider audience, and specifically so for India, uh, knowing the, the base that we're talking about. Having said that, uh, uh, yes, there are definitely concerns when we talk about uh, using technology, uh, but I think uh, we need to respect the intelligence of the learners. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, the basic premise is uh, the technology that can enable things to happen, but at the same time, the learners should r understand the reality that this technology can help them in a lifelong learning, that, uh, what Shantanu mentioned. And at the same time, are we misutilizing the technology? I think we should leave it to the maturity of the learners. There would be some intervention that may be required uh, and there would be some security aspects that will be built up in the technology for ensuring that, that it's not being misutilized by the learners who are going to access uh, the programs that the government is rolling out. But I'll just leave it at that. I think it's, we should respect the maturity of the learners, and I'm sure these people would understand that. And just to add to that point, Pratik, uh, you know, the point about 
potential risks when we go down that path and we'll have to evaluate those risks and see how do we mitigate the risks. But I think in my mind and I think I'm sure in everybody's mind, the risks of not going down that path are far greater. So we need to make sure we mitigate the risks of going down that path but still move ahead. Well said. So the, we have a last one. Yes. Sorry, I have taken the time. In my last 18 years of teaching, before joining AICT, of course, I'm a teacher first. I used to say the word which I'm using here. We are creating engineers, 6,85,000 engineers we are creating as per my AICT recent data because now I'm in the AICT, so I know the exact data. If we are not providing the channel, we are creating techno-terrorists. Please, we are creating techno-terrorists because we are teaching so advancements, you know. We are showing them NASA. We are showing them ISRO. We are showing them satellites. We are showing them missiles. But how many could reach over there? Out of the 10,000, all are brilliant. Because each and every human being has something in their mind that is called a skill. Owner. Jugaad. Just common skill development ka naam de di India mein. The thing is that, jab tak, aaj ki institutions apni ego ko chhod ke, aaj ki industry, apni us vyastha ko chhod ke, haath nahi milayenge, हम कुछ भी इस प्लेटफॉर्म से बातें करें जितनी बड़ी भारी भरकम बातें करें टेक्नोलॉजी की तब तक सलूशन नहीं मिलने वाला वी हैव टू ज्वाइन हैंड्स इन इंडियन सिस्टम वी हैव द इंडस्ट्री इंस्टीट्यूशन इंट्रैक्शन व्हिच इज मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट सो कॉल्ड नीम नेशनल एनहांसमेंट एम्प्लॉयबिलिटी मिशन वी हैव टू रन विद दिस दिस इज आई थिंक ओनली द सलूशन कैन बी गिवन या माय क्वेश्चन इज फॉर रमनप्रीत uh, see, uh, this is happening with uh, wherever I visit and this is typically be the institutions are being asked when the Swayam was going to be launched. You know, we have been running uh, different uh, online uh, blended courses, already we have a content. Are you making any efforts to repurpose the content which can be suited to the Swayam? Because the problem is everywhere we need not reinvent the wheel again and again and again. Like, you know, uh, e partshala to the EPG partshala to the EPG square partshala, E acharya, wo acharya. Are you doing to doing something again, otherwise, than the waste of time of uh, individuals? That's, I would that's, like that's, a, that's a wonderful, yes, it's a wonderful question. It's a need of our. These all MOOCs are there. We honor, we respect all the MOOCs, rather, ye hamare moti hai. Humne sirf mala banai hai. Kyuki bacha, kisi bi MOOCs pe jake, wo value addition to kar hi sakta hai. E partial like MOOCs means wonderful, amazing, no doubt. But tomorrow, if he says, I spent time on my system, I learned it, can I have a job through this? Yes, you can have a job. Because SRAM is the only national platform which is going to give you the credits, which is going to give you the certificate, either from the QCI, either from NSDC, either from AICT, either from UGC, that tomorrow you can produce this certificate. Because when you go to the industry or a government services, they will ask first, you prove your identity. Are you really a skilled laborer? Are you really a skilled electrician? Are you really a skilled plumber? I will not allow you to be come to my house. Don't touch my tap until unless you show the certificate, you know, this is the domain. So the SWAM is the only platform through which the all my learner students can have the 20% credits, rest 80% they have to earn from their conventional study and rest of the whole Indian citizens who learn by taste and later on they want to convert it for the profession, they can do that is only with the SWAM, sir. Because that they will, these MOOCs will give only validation, but the SWAM will give the certification also. What, this is the one. Yeah, please. What, what about the courses which we are already running in our institutions? Of course, they are not ready based, exactly, for example. Exactly. So tomorrow, if you want to, can, is there any facility to transfer the entire content to SWAM? Uh, will, you, will, you, will you allow them to do that? We, yeah. we are already doing it. From NPTL, we already have taken the number of courses, we are approving and we are putting on that and the courses started from the 8th standard. Okay. As on today, there was no any MOOC which is for the 8th standard, we have IIT PAL also. For tomorrow, students don't have to go to the some like a city like Kota to learn for a JE Advance or JE. We are going to have the IIT PAL also. These courses are not available in the MOOCs because they are charging huge money and it is totally free of cost. Totally free of cost. So the yeah. answer to your question is yes. yes. Correct. I was right. about to say it. I think yeah. the answer is yes. Uh, I think uh, the beauty about uh, the Swayam project is the fact that any and any content can actually come onto the platform. 
Having said that, the quality has to be maintained because at the end of the day, we are expecting the students to use it, right? So the quality has to be ensured. I think what AICT and the um, Government of India has done is they've created a coordination committee that before the content comes onto the Swayam portal, it has to be approved by that coordination committee, uh, uh, which gives the flexibility, which means that you can provide your content uh, onto the uh, portal, but that before it comes to the final portal, it will, has to be approved by the coordinating committee, and after that, it's going to come onto the uh, portal. I think that's important because we need to maintain the quality of the program. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm being told that we need to close the session. So ladies and gentlemen, we... Oh, yeah, go ahead. And we have, sir, our team has given 42 MOOCs on the Swayam platform. It's all this is available on the UGC. And it is the EPG Partshala content that we had created. We have repurposed into weekly structures. And we'll be putting teachers as MOOC coordinators who will be helping these students. Sir, my uh, concern and the challenges we are facing at the ground level team working is, when we started in 2013, and if I compare our model with NPTEL, we started almost in 1999 and 2003 formal launch. In last 13 years, they have prepared 96 courses. In last two and a half years, we have produced 42 MOOCs. So that's the effort which our team is doing. And that is only possible because of the thousands of teachers we have been able to motivate. So one point which initially also at UGC forums we have been literally fighting that there should be incentive to the teachers, recognition do, to the do teachers. You, do you have a question or do you have a comment? Sir, uh, no, I have a comment that would you all this will be possible only if the teachers are made very, very important component. Thank so you. that is yes. one thing. Another thing is when we look at the implementation of these MOOCs, the UCs uh, the, at the university level, academic council and executive councils, I think there should be something because now these 42 MOOCs are there, but first level is Delhi University, whether they will accept this to provide. Another will be every university, will it go into that yes, do we approve this course or not? So my humble question is, I think it should be the learner who should decide whether I want to take this course or not, not any university system. That is one point I wanted to make. And another thing is looking at the regional needs of India, the platform also should provide facility because right now it is only in English medium. We should have it in Hindi and other multilingual formats because the subjects we offer range from Sanskrit to Spanish and so on, not only the English. And even from subjects like chemistry from where I come, I don't think equation, editor, and all tools are there. So we should really look at all these fronts. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And you have a session here yes. with Charles Dickens to Jugaad. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a Happy lot. Lunch. Thanks a lot, everybody. Before I thank the wonderful panelists here, I would like to just share one uh, information with everybody here. Sandeep, you mentioned about public-private partnerships. What we are working on is a white paper. CIA is working on a white paper with KPMG. And the entire inputs from this conference are going to go into that white paper, which we are going to present to the government. And hopefully, some wonderful results are going to come out of that. And now, I thank all the panelists and invite everybody for lunch. Please don't go away after this session. Please stay on for the entire conference. Thank you.
थैंक यू शुक्रिया